Welcome back, my amazing students. This is going to be the introduction video for part one of our histology lab. So here's how it's going to work. We've broken down histology into two labs, all right? And as you're going to see on Blackboard, there is our actual lab sheet that I've pulled up here. And this just gives you a rundown of the tissues that you're going to be responsible for knowing, right? And it says that right here, right? There's 20 total tissues. For part one of the lab, so our first week, we're gonna be covering epithelial and muscle tissue. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about in this video. And then next week, we're gonna be talking about connective and nervous tissue, all right? But for this first video, this week you're gonna have the microscope lab, but then also, because there's so many tissues, I encourage you to get started with the tissues. So do the microscope lab first, and then get started with the first part of the histology, which is gonna be epithelial tissue and muscle tissue. Are you ready? Even if you're not ready, here we go. So histology is the study of tissues, and we're gonna be talking about 20 total, okay? And for each of those 20 tissues, you're going to need to be able to identify it by a picture. And I mean a real picture of what you would see in a microscope. So that's the first thing I'm gonna be reviewing with you in this video. For the epithelial and muscle tissues, I'm gonna give you some tips to help you visually identify them. And then, after you're able to identify them by picture, you're gonna to have to know one location of where that tissue was found in the body and one function of that tissue. So really, there's 20 tissues, but for each of those 20, you have to know one location and one function, so it's really 60 things. This is why I'm encouraging you to start this week with the tissues, okay? Now, the tissues can certainly be overwhelming at first. However, out of the 20, there's probably a couple that you already are gonna be able to identify. You probably will be able to identify what a nerve, what nerve tissue looks like. Adipose is really unique. Blood, you're gonna be able to identify that. Bone is pretty easy. So if you already think that there's four or five that you are gonna be able to identify probably already, um, it's really not a big ask. And I don't mean to give you a bad harbinger of the future, but when we get to the bones, you're gonna to have to know 90 plus bone structures. You're gonna to have to know 40 plus muscles. So I encourage you to do well on the tissues. There's not as many to know, and even if it seems overwhelming at first, you can absolutely do it. You just have to put the time in, and it really is all about memorization. Okay, enough of me blabbering on. Let's get to epithelial and muscle tissues. Now, in addition to the main lab sheet, you're also going to see on Blackboard a PowerPoint. And this is what I'm going to use because it has the pictures, right? So this is what I'm gonna to use to go through what each of these different tissues is like. But you're also, hold on, there we go. You're also gonna see something called tissue practical review. And these are all 20 tissues unlabeled in random order. So this can be a good way, sometimes people like to make flashcards uh, as a way of just memorizing them. So I'm giving you uh, some great resources. All right, so let's tackle epithelial and muscle tissue. Okay, now what are going to be some keys for identifying epithelial tissue? It's going to have something called free space. And what I mean by that is there's going to be some part of the microscope slide where there's no tissue. So you see in the middle here, there's no cells in that part of the tissue, which is just free. 
So that's going to be a characteristic of all epithelial tissues. Let me go ahead to some other ones. In this case, the free space is in the absolute middle of each one, of each cell. Let's give some other ideas. Here, the free space is in the middle. Oh, wrong one. Here, the white free space is in the middle. Okay? Or, I'll show you just one more, not to belabor the point. Or, the free space might be at the edge. And the reason that there's free space, is what I call it, is because epithelial tissue tends to surround things or line our body organs. Skin is a great example of epithelial tissue. Let me actually, I'll show you the skin. This is what the epidermis of the skin looks like. So we see free space because this is the skin and the skin butts up against the outside of the body, for example. So this is gonna be a key for epithelial tissue. Let me just go ahead to muscle tissue and I'm sorry, there's no other way that I can scroll. But if you look here, this does not have free space. I mean, you might see a little bit of white in here, but it's not the same. There's not an area of free space on one end, or there's not an area of free space in the middle of something. So the other tissue types will take up the whole microscope slide, but epithelial tissue will have some free space. So that is one characteristic. There's some other things that we'll talk about in lecture, whether you have me or someone else for lecture, um, but I'm, always, I'm only talking about what we need to know for lab. There is something else interesting about, interesting about epithelial tissue. It is always bound by connective tissue underneath. And it's not, all, it's not often that we can say always. You know how on an exam, usually, if you have a true false question and it says always or never, usually, you know, that's, you know, that's usually false. But here is a case where we can say always. Underneath, so from here to here is the epithelial tissue. At its base, this darker red is connective tissue. Not a big deal in terms of learning how to identify these tissues, but if we were in the lab and I was going to actually have you get a stomach slide, this, is a, this picture here is of the stomach. If I was going to actually have you get a stomach slide and look at it, you would be able to identify the epithelial and the connective underneath, and you would have to know where to look. Here, we've already done that work for you. Okay, so epithelial tissue has a free space. So when you're on the tissue practical, we've got 20 pictures, one of each. This is a way you can start to go through the process of elimination. Maybe the first question you ask yourself is, is there free space? And if the answer is yes, then you're going to be you're going to start to think epithelial tissue. Now, once you know it's epithelial tissue, it's actually pretty simple because the epithelial the types of epithelial tissue are named based on how many layers there are and the shape of the cell. Isn't it nice people? You know, so often scientists have these crazy names for things, but here we actually have something that makes sense. And this is why we're starting with this at the beginning of our tissue lab. It will get harder in the connective tissue. But here we see, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six epithelial tissues to know, and they're all named by the number of layers and the shape. It's pretty simple. If an epithelial tissue has one layer only, it's one layer thick, then it's named simple. If it has two or more layers, it is said to be stratified. We'll talk about pseudostratified when we get to pseudostratified columnar. Let's just start with simple versus stratified. If an epithelial tissue has one layer, it is called simple. If it has two or more layers, it is called stratified. 
After you identify that, then we look at the shape of the cell. Is it flat? Squamous, like a pancake. Is it square? Is the shape of each cell square? Then it's cuboidal. Or is the shape of each cell column-like? And then we can mix and match. So look at our first example, simple squamous. Just by looking at that, we know it has one layer and the cells that make it up are flat. Perfect. By the way, uh, a lot of people say squamous, simple squamous. I say simple squamous. Say it how you want. It means flat. So these next couple slides review the same thing that I already said. Let's get right to the tissue types. So our first tissue type is simple squamous, has one layer, and the cells are flat. Now, when I look at this picture, to me, it looks like a desert floor. I'm gonna give you some tips that have helped me. Maybe it sinks in with your brain, maybe it doesn't. Um, but I, it is helpful if you can think of something. To me, this looks like a cracked desert floor. The free space here is in the middle. Now, in terms of function and location, you could list a bunch of functions and locations. And in fact, as long as you give me a function or location that's true, you'll get the points. But if you want, go along with me here because I'm gonna give you, for each of these, I'm gonna give you one location and one function just to make life easier. So one of the most common places that we think of for simple squamous epithelial tissue is in the lungs. More specifically, they're found in the alveoli, the air sacs of the lungs. And because it's one layer, it's thin, right? Simple squamous, it's one layer. In the case of the lungs, this is going to allow for diffusion of gases. In this case, the structure matches the function, principle of complementarity, right? Here in the air sacs of the lungs, we want them to be surrounded by a thin tissue type because we want gases to actually be able to diffuse through it. It wouldn't make sense to have a stratified tissue here with 20 layers. As we're gonna find out, that's gonna be more of a function of protection to have many, many layers. But in the case of a simple epithelial tissue, it's more likely that we want to allow for diffusion or filtration or something. In this case, diffusion of gases. All right, good stuff. Let's talk about simple cuboidal. Well, we know that it has one layer because it's simple, but now the cells are cube shaped. Now in this picture, it can be a little tricky, but let's, let's unpack it. In this picture, each one of these is a cell, but the cells happen to align themselves in a little circular shape. And the free space is in the middle. So it is simple cuboidal because the layer of cells that surround that free space is one layer, right? It's one layer and the cells are cube shaped simple cuboidal. One place that we find this is in the kidney tubules. Now, if you choose to memorize this location, you're gonna to have to say kidney tubules. You can't just say kidneys because other places in the kidneys, aside from the tubules, are actually made up of other tissue types, but it is in the kidney tubules that we have simple cuboidal. And the idea here, you could use secretion or absorption, I would accept that, but we know what the kidneys do, they filter the blood and produce urine. So here again, we want to have only one layer, 
because we want this part of the kidney to be able to filter the blood or filter the filtrate, which we'll talk about in AMP2. Now, uh, when I look at this picture, it kind of looks like someone put together, it's almost as if you were holding a bunch of straws, you know, like you took a bundle of straws and then you looked out at the top of them and we're only seeing the tops of the straws. That's kind of what it reminds me of. But you use whatever way that makes sense to you. All right. Now it makes sense that we've had simple squamous, we've had simple cuboidal. It only makes sense now that we have simple columnar. So it's one layer, but now the cells are column shaped. And this is the picture we talked about in our example at the very beginning. Here, each example of simple columnar is one layer. And then if we look at the cells, wouldn't you say that they are column shaped? Yeah, pretty much, right? These dark little guys are the nucle nuclei. One layer of column shaped cells. We find this in the digestive tract. So this happens to be a stomach, but you will, will, will also find simple columnar epithelial tissue in the inner lining of the small intestine. And one main function is absorption. In the small intestine, that's, this is how we absorb nutrients. So again, you could pick any of the functions or any of the locations. I'm just trying to give you what I think to be our really common examples of the tissue type and pretty as easy as I can make it. So simple columnar, one layer of column shaped cells, free spaces in the middle. We find it lining GI tract organs and it's fun one function is absorption. Excellent. Now we have this special case called pseudostratified columnar. And what's happening here is it's pseudo stratified. So it looks stratified, but really isn't. It's like fake stratified. So it looks stratified, but it really isn't. Let's talk about why. If you look at this little picture here, we see that the nuclei, some are low and some are high. And because of that, you could make the mistake of thinking that there's one layer of tissue here and another layer of tissue there. So it appears to be stratified because the nuclei are at different levels, but in actuality, it is only one layer. So it's really only one layer, but it looks like more. And let me go back for a second, because if we look at our example of simple columnar, not pseudostratified columnar, but our good old plain old fashioned simple columnar, the nuclei are arranged at one level, right? So it's easier to see that this is only one layer of tissue because the nuclei are at the same level. But here, the nuclei, some are high, some are low, so it could give the illusion that it looks stratified when in fact it's really simple. All right, and of course it's columnar, so the cells are column shaped. So in this picture, let me use green, I'll use this one. This is what the cells look like, okay? So indeed it's one, it is one layer. The cells are column shaped. We've got free space here. And let me give you a tip, because it's not necessarily easily easy to see that the nuclei are at different levels here, but you know what we can see? Cilia. So when you see free space and cilia, 
and these column-shaped cells, you're going to think pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. If I go back, now, if you look really closely, you can see some cilia. There's almost like a haze over it. Because if you were to look even closer under magnification, there are tiny little cilia in simple columnar, but nowhere near as obvious as in the pseudostratified columnar. So you see free space and you see column-shaped cells and longer cilia, little hairs, you know that it's going to be pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. We find this, excuse me, the best example of this would be the trachea. And you could pick any of the functions. You could say secretion because we do secrete mucus at the trachea. You could say filters debris because the cilia helps to filter out debris. Okay, good. Two more to go, stratified squamous. So up to this point, all of our epithelial tissues have been simple, and now we get stratified. So obviously we've got many, many layers. Imagine that each layer is thin like a pancake. So we've got all these layers on top of each other. So it's obviously stratified. And in this case, the cells are flat. So two or more layers stratified, flat-shaped cells, squamous. Therefore, we have stratified squamous. One place where we find this is the skin. But if you just say skin, not good enough. It is in the outer layer of the skin, otherwise known as the epidermis. So you could say epidermis, or you could say outer layer of skin. And because it's stratified, its function is protection. Structure matches function. On the outer layer of skin, which is exposed to the world, we need protection. So therefore, we don't just have one layer of tissue because that would not provide much protection. We've got many, many, many layers of, ep of epithelial tissue. Cool stuff, right? And we've got one more. And that is transitional. This is the only epithelial tissue that doesn't fit into the same naming of number of layers and shape of cells. When you see transitional tissue, you're going to see free space. And you're going to see puffy cells. They look pretty puffy to me. This is unique to transitional tissue. And the reason why we have these puffy cells is because its function is to allow for stretch. One place where we find it, bladder. The bladder can be more empty or it can be more full. And as such, the actual bladder wall can actually expand or recoil. And the inner lining of the bladder wall can do that, expand or recoil, because it has the transitional tissue. So you're not going to be counting layers or shapes of cell. All you're going to see is free space and puffy cells. And we're going to know that it's transitional epithelial tissue. Excellent. Now remember, I have these same tissues mixed up without the labels on them in another PowerPoint for you available on Blackboard called Tissue Practical Review. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Some of these we haven't gotten to yet, simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, okay? Now, you know, we've been together for a couple of weeks now. You may not know this about me, but we're probably getting to that point. I'm not always going to make things as easy because I want you to really know these. And if I tested you 
on these same pictures. Well, then it would just be like playing that, that memory game as a kid where you turn the cards over and then one at a time you turn two over until you can match them up. Well, I don't want to test your ability to match. I want you to know the characteristics. So certainly use these pictures to study from, but don't use these pictures alone. Let me find transitional in here. Let's see. There's transitional. Because if you look at only these alone, in addition to knowing that transitional has free space and puffy cells, you're going to start to remember transitional as being purple. Because in this picture, they stained the microscope slide with a purple color. But guess what? Not all transitional tissue is going to look purple under a microscope. It just depends on whatever color dye they use. So let me give you two websites that are good resources. If you just go into Google and you search University of Kansas histology, they have some great pictures. They have more pictures than we need to know. And sometimes they may have a picture that doesn't show the characteristics like we talked about. In that case, just ignore it. But there's going to be plenty of other pictures that we did cover that have the same characteristics. Another one that you can go to if you just type in Loyola University Histology. Use these other resources because it's going to help you. I'm telling you, if you only look at these, you're going to condition yourself to memorize the color. And I want you to not just be able to match. I want you to be able to really understand the characteristics. Okay, we have covered all of the epithelial tissue. Let's end this first part of the lab by talking about muscle tissue. We have three types of muscle tissue. Now, when we see the actual slides of muscle tissue, they do look pretty unique. They're very dense. There is no free space. And in two out of three of the muscles, they have vertical striations. So if you look at this picture, this is cardiac muscle. Can you see the little like ribs going up and down? Those are striations. There are striations in this one, right? Doot, 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 like zebra stripes almost. So muscle tissue is going to be really dense. And let's first look at skeletal muscle. And get in the habit of not just saying skeletal, but saying skeletal muscle. Okay? Skeletal muscle. Really dense. And striated, like I said, has those vertical striations. And in skeletal muscle, there's very little space between each of these little thingies. Scientific term. And I bring that up because we can compare this to cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle also has striations, but there's a little bit more space space in between. So that's how I would differentiate cardiac muscle from skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle is striated, pretty dense, but cardiac muscle has more spaces in between. Skeletal muscle is really dense, has striations with not very many spaces in between. Where do we find these? Well, the skeletal muscles are the ones attached to bones. And we know what they do. But be more specific, voluntary movement. This is the only one of the three types of muscle tissue that is voluntarily controlled. All right, so skeletal muscle, really dense, has striations, very little space in between. We find it in muscles attached to bones, and the function is voluntary movement. 
cardiac muscle also has striations, but there's a little bit more space in between the, the cells and tissues. This is found in the heart. And you could say for a function involuntary contraction or propels blood. But I want you to know that this is involuntary. And I think you understand this. You don't have to voluntarily tell your heart to contract. Okay, heart, contract. Okay, heart, do it again. Contract, voluntary. Because <laughs> ultimately we'd forget. But our skeletal muscles, we can tell them voluntarily when to contract and when to relax. One other feature that we'll talk about more in AMP too, but one other feature of cardiac muscle is something called the intercalated discs. And if you look every so often, there's a darker little band. This is not the case of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle looks the same throughout pretty much. But in cardiac muscle, every so often we see those intercalated discs. What we're gonna find out later is that these intercalated discs allow the nerve impulse to spread more rapidly through cardiac muscle, which is a good thing because it allows the heart chambers to contract all at once as a unit, right? So all the walls of the atria contract at once, and then all the walls of the ventricles contract at once. And they can only do that because the nerve impulse moves very quickly through these specialized intercalated discs. All righty, my friends, last one is smooth muscle. Why is it called smooth muscle? Because there's no striations. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle had those vertical lines. Smooth muscle does not. Smooth muscle has very smooth edges. When we talk about the connective tissues next week, you're gonna see a difference where another tissue type that is sometimes confused for this one, it has irregular edges. But one way that we know it's smooth muscle, there's no striations, it's very dense, and the edges of the tissue are very smooth. We find this in the walls of our major organs. So actually, you could say that. You could say walls of the GI tract because in addition to the inner lining of the GI tract being simple columnar epithelial tissue, the deeper layer of the GI tract is smooth muscle. And the function is really propulsion because smooth muscle, it contracts in a different way than skeletal and cardiac muscle which by the way, we're gonna talk about in lecture this semester, but it contracts a little differently. And the way that smooth muscle contracts is it kind of like squeezes things along. So you can imagine peristalsis, which is how we move things through the esophagus, how we move things through the small intestine, kind of propels food through the GI tract. I do wanna point out <laughs> in the book here, I love how they say for function, Propel substances or objects, food stuff, urine, a baby. Because <laughs> indeed the uterine wall is made up of smooth muscle, which during childbirth contracts to help push the baby out. But I just love how they say that. Propel substances, you know, like a baby. All right, my fine friends, we have talked about epithelial and muscular tissue. Study, 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 make note cards. This is a lot of memorization. Memorize one location, one function. Go to the other websites that I suggested. And then next week, we'll finish it off with the other two.